everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Vidstedt. I run the Java Virtual Machine team at Oracle. And the next 40, 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk about JDK Flight Recorder. So start, let's start with what is Flight Recorder? Well, imagine that you're sitting at home uh, Saturday evening. Everything is good. You've just made dinner. You're going to relax, watch your favorite TV show. And all of a sudden, you get a notification. Your business critical application has some kind of issue. This is your money maker. It's important that it's up and running. But it's down now for some reason. So what do you do? Well, you log in and you start looking around to see what actually happened, right? What's going on? Why isn't the service up and running anymore? Uh, after looking around a bit, you realize that, well, you sort of see which area it's in, but you can't figure out what exactly made the service go down. So, well, what can you do? Well, you can reboot it and hope for the best, but you do one more better than that, right? It's like, surely if this happens again, it would be nice to get some more data. So you add some logging information, you capture some more information, and you add that to the code, and then you restart the application. And everything seems to be working well. So the, the app is now up and running, and you go and do your thing. You watch your favorite TV show. So later in the week, you start looking at this, and you try to make sense of what, what was actually going on. You still don't have anything to really work with. And somebody worse, somebody points out that this code that you added actually have a, has a performance overhead. So you can't have this in production. It's consuming too much resources. Uh, and after a while, you have the complicated discussion, and you all realize that, well, we need to remove this logging again. And lo and behold, Saturday evening, you've just made dinner, and you're about to watch your favorite TV show. The same notification comes again, right? So you're in this circle of not getting enough information to do anything about this. So in the aviation industry, they've already sort of solved this problem. Uh, there's a concept of a flight recorder, as we all know. And it's all there in the background, recording all kinds of information about what's going on. And if something happens, you can both see what happened at that very moment. But you can also get this historical data leading up to that event. And that's basically what we've done with flight recorder in the Java runtime. So Flight Recorder is, and I'm going to go through the summary quickly, and then we're going to spend the next 40 minutes looking at more of the details what, about what Flight Recorder is. But Flight Recorder is an event-based tracing framework that we've built into the Java runtime itself. Uh, I'm going to, in some cases, probably say JFR. That's the abbreviation we use. Uh, what it does is to continuously, much like a real flight recorder, continuously uh, record data about everything that's sort of going on in the runtime. Uh, and this data can be optionally written to disk. Um, but otherwise, it's just there in the background in memory collecting good information. Flight Recorder has extremely low latency. And as a matter of fact, one of our design points with JFR is to keep that overhead less than 1%. This is meant for and designed for use in productions. You're meant to have this on for your applications. We have very powerful APIs both to produce your own data, but also to consume it in the other end. Uh, and as I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, we have both a graphical user interface, uh, and we also have command line tools, and you can use your own agents or your own code to analyze the data that Flight Recorder produces. The events themselves are produced either by the Java runtime itself. I'm going to go through in a, in a few minutes the kind of events we have. But you can also, as I mentioned, produce your own events for your application. And I'll show you in a bit why that is so powerful. The events can be filtered uh, and stored either in memory, as I mentioned, or if you want to store it to disk and analyze it later, you can do that as well. Uh, and we aggregate these events into what we call recordings. Uh, and uh, when you dump it to disk, we normally use uh, the, the, the file extension JFR. Uh, the file format, the disk on file format, is very uh, highly optimized and dense. So you can represent a lot of valuable information in a very small file. It's very, a very dense format. So this is all very theoretical. Uh, what I'm going to do is to give you a quick demo of what, what this looks like. And then we'll talk about the more of the details about JFR. But here's an example of the kind of information you can get with JFR. So what I'm showing you here is a graphical user interface called JMC, or Java, uh, sorry, JDK Mission Control. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the UI in great detail. I'm just going to click through it very, very quickly to sort of, again, give you a feeling for the kind of data that we're collecting and that you can look at. Um, and again, this is graphical. There are command line uh, tools for this as well that I'll show you later. 
so just as an over, uh, overview here, you can see the kind of uh, information that J4 collects. Uh, it's everything from which, uh, how much like CPU you're using, the, the amount of Java heap that gets used, how methods are being executed, uh, and how the VM optimizes them. Uh, uh, there's uh, information about the file I.O., so which files do you read and write to, uh, socket I.O. In, the, in, the ca in cases where the application is actually using it, in this case my uh, test application here isn't. You can get a lot of detailed information about garbage collection, what exactly is the garbage collector up to, why is a, is a garbage collection taking long time, the kind of objects that you're allocating, all that kind of information. Um, and um, you can also just have a sort of raw look at all the events themselves. So the events are collected in the background, you can look at them individually, but JMC uh, Mission Control here also provides you with a few different views onto that data, which may help you make sense of what your application is up to. So again, that's just the kind of, uh, get, to give you, give you a feeling of the kind, for the kind of information that JA4 collects and that you can look at. So, I mentioned events, and events are very central to how Flight Recorder works, so therefore I'm going to step through what an event is in sort of in details or to, to a, a lower level. Um, on a high level, an event is just sort of a binary blob of data that we store inside of the file, but logically it sort of contains these fields, if you so will. Uh, the first one is the event ID. Uh, uh, the ID is an, a unique identifier for this event in a recording, so that you can sort of ref reference it, re refer to it in some way. Uh, there is a timestamp that tells us when this event happened. And some events, not all do, but some events have a, a second timestamp, the end timestamp, uh, and therefore the duration of the event. Some events are instantaneous, so they don't have a duration, but many events do. And we'll talk about why that's important or powerful in a few minutes. These timestamps, so this is sort of an implementation detail, but we are using the CPU tick to get the timestamp. And the reason why I mentioned that is because that's all in, in, again, coming back to sort of the performance overhead here. Grabbing the CPU tick is very cheap for us. So that's what we, what we use to get the duration and the start time of an event. But later, if you want to analyze this data, you can obviously turn it into something more human uh, friendly. Uh, an event may have a thread ID. So that's which thread uh, did generate this event, what was executing, or wh which thread was it executing in at the time. An event uh, can also have a stack trace. Uh, it's optional. Uh, but this is actually one of the powers of Flight Recorder, that not only will you get the event itself and the information about what was going on, but you can also see how you got there, what was being executed, the, the sort of the, the stack trace that got you to the point where this event was triggered. Uh, another implementation detail here is that in the actual recording itself, we're not storing the full stack trace for every event, but rather we pool them, because it does turn out that stack traces are in many cases the exact same, so we can share them, and what's then used in the actual event itself is just an ID referencing that pooled set of stack traces. And finally, uh, an event can have event-specific payload, so depending on the kind of event, you have additional uh, data points on top of this. So that's still very theoretical. Let's look at code. Uh, let's say that I have my super important business critical application here, and it has this really important method called do thing, which does something. I haven't specified what it does, but maybe it processes HTTP requests or whatever. It's the comment there is. Replace it with whatever makes sense to you. What I'm gonna do now is to generate a JDK flight recorder event for my really important business logic here. And the way I do that is by implementing a, a class. Much like a nor normal plain old Java object, uh, I create a type. And what I do is I extend an existing type that JFR exposes called event. It's in the jdk.jfr package. So now I have an event type. And the next thing I do is uh, generate an event uh, in my application here. And I, I do that by injecting some code around the actual handling that I want to instrument in some way. And I'll step you through this uh, every line in itself. The first thing I do is to allocate an instance of this type, very much like you're used to for normal Java objects. Uh, I call begin on the event, and this will grab the start timestamp for that event. Again, using very efficient JVM known, known instructions, sort of, to grab this very efficiently. I do my business logic, whatever that is, 
And when I'm done with it, I call end. And end will grab the ending timestamp and therefore calculate the duration of this event. And finally, I call commit. And commit is what will actually take this event, the, the data we collected about it, and feed it into the recording in the background. It should be noted that this is all done using thread local buffers initially. So the, the writes here are very, very efficient. They happen thread locally, so very cache efficient and with low performance overhead. And then in the background, JFR will process these thread local buffers and convert them or turn them into actual recording streams, which you can then optionally again store to disk. But that's all happening in the background uh, so that you don't affect the, the actual thread executing the business logic here. One thing to note is that if you don't call end, commit will do that for you. There are cases where you may want to split them up in case you want to do some kind of computation, let's say, on it. Uh, but in many cases, what you'll get away with is just calling commit without calling end. So this is sort of what a typical event code generation thing will look like. But in itself, this is not very interesting. Uh, the only thing we'll get from this is the event itself. Uh, and maybe we want to include some business logic specific information here. And the way we do that is, should be very natural sort of. We just add some fields to the event type. Uh, in this case, I've added an uh, ID field, which is supposed to sort of represent the transaction ID here in some way. And I've also added a message field, uh, but this could be literally anything. Uh, whatever makes sense for your specific uh, business operation here. Uh, and in the business log on the business logic side, you can see that I'm initializing these fields in sort of the, the normal way. You can do this in the constructor if you want to, but uh, in this case, I'm initializing them explicitly. And of course, you're seeing here that I'm actually hard coding values. Uh, you obviously wouldn't do that, I'm, I'm assuming at least for your business logic, you'd actually use the real transaction ID and maybe the URI for the request, something like that. This is all it takes to add your own event to the stream. Uh, one thing you can do, and which I strongly recommend you to do, is to help, um, with, the, uh, to help with the visualization and anal analysis of these events. It does help to provide some additional information. And this information will also be captured in the recording files. Uh, and the way you do that is by using annotations. Uh, there are a number of them. I'll show you on the next uh, slide uh, a table of the a few of the most important ones. Uh, but in order here, the, the first one I add is something called name. By default, every, every event has a name. By default, it's the full class name, which is then the reverse domain uh, name of the class. And in some cases, that is maybe not the best chosen name. You want something maybe that is more stable. Um, and so in this case, I'm explicitly calling it com.example.transaction. Uh, it still should follow sort of the reverse domain syntax, but apart from that, it, you're free to choose. Uh, the next annotation is label. Uh, that is a human-friendly description of this event, uh, but it's supposed to be short, just a few words. Uh, and so in this case, uh, I call it business transaction. We'll sh uh, see in a minute how mission control chooses to visualize this. Uh, the next annotation is description. Again, it's a human-friendly string, but it's allowed to or thought to be a bit longer. It's maybe a couple of sentences or so. Uh, I'll skip category and we'll get back to that, but you can also see that I added the label annotation for the two fields as well, which again are sort of human-friendly descriptions of what those fields are supposed to be, or the semantics of them. So what does this look like on the visualization side? Well, your different visualization frameworks can do this differently, but let's have a look at mission control specifically. I, I showed you that GUI in the, uh, a few minutes ago. And what uh, mission control does is uh, it, it has these different views onto the data, but if you just go and look at sort of the raw uh, set of events, it will, there is a view that where you can see that in a tree structure. And the tree structure itself is created by using the categories for the event. So in this case, I did add, add two categories. Um, and these are sort of the breadcrumbs that get you to the actual event itself. Uh, on the top level, there's, I've named it business app. And then the, the second part or second level of that annotation is business ops. Could be anything. But as you can see, what mission control does with this is to create a tree. Uh, so you, you have uh, something that you can look into, sort of drill into, uh, and uh, eventually you get to the actual event itself. The, the name of that in this tree structure, tree view, is the label, comes from the label. You can also see that I'm hovering over that uh, entry in the list, and what I get is a tooltip that includes the description. 
Finally, uh, I have the actual fields themselves represented in the table on the right. And you can see there that the heading includes the label from the field and also its value. So we can see here that the 4711 that I had hard coded uh, ends up in this list as well. So that's sort of an, an example of uh, how this can be visualized, but we'll see later how this is more flexible. You can do your own visualization if you want to. Key thing is that the, if you add this color to the event, you will get better, there will be more opportunity, let's say, to visualize it in a useful way in the other end. Uh, so this, is, this list is not complete, but it's uh, showing a few of the annotations that you can use for JDK Flight Recorder. Uh, we've already seen uh, a few of them. I'll mention the three at the bottom. Uh, so there's a threshold, which is the default duration over which an event will be included in the recording. So uh, actually one of the key things with Flight Recorder is that you can collect a lot of data, a lot, a lot of very fine-grained and valuable data. But if, you're, if you don't watch out, you'll get too much data. Uh, and one of the ways we've found of keeping the data to a, a reasonable size and not affect performance too much is by filtering out the data, and in particular filtering on duration. Because in many cases, what you'll find is that your events are really only interesting if they take longer than some specified time, which does depend on the exact event in question. For a garbage collection, it could be pauses taking longer than 10 milliseconds. For your business app, it could be requests taking longer than 250 milliseconds, for example. Uh, but the threshold is sort of an, a key thing, a way of filtering this data out. So the threshold annotation is useful for default filtering. Uh, there's an annotation called enabled, which controls whether this event is enabled or not by default. And you can again control that uh, later if you want to, override it. And finally, there's a stack trace annotation which uh, tells you whether or not the stack trace should be included for this event. One of the key things that actually drives the performance and the overhead when it comes to JFR is the depth of the stack trace that you capture, uh, or if you capture one at all, I should say. So uh, using that annotation, you can control this. But all of this is, again, uh, possible to override later, override later. Uh, if you want to see more about the, the JFR APIs, uh, the documentation, and especially the annotations, uh, you can look at our Java doc for JFR, uh, which has a lot of good information to help you get started. Okay, so we've seen what an event is, and we've also seen that there is a bunch of stuff that Mission Control, for example, visualizes. So what kind of events do we have in the Java runtime? Uh, this is, again, not an exhaustive list. There are, uh, in total, actually in JDK 20, roughly 180 events, and that's growing as we find additional things that we want to capture. Uh, but if we start from the top on the Java execution side, you have things like, as we saw, I.O., both on the file and socket slash network side. We have thread sampling, so every once in a while we stop threads and to see where they're out executing code, and that can help you understand what your application is up to. Uh, we do capture, as of uh, some relatively recent release, finalization events. So if, in case you missed it, um, we do, uh, we have since uh, JDK 18, I think, uh, deprecated finalization for removal. Maybe it was an early release. That's actually one of the challenges, by the way, uh, is keeping track of which release we did what in because we have releases every six months. So excuse me if I get the releases wrong, but um, finalizers are deprecated for removal. Uh, and in order to help you see where your application, or for that sake, your third party libraries may be using finalizers, there's now a helpful event that gets generated that you can have a look at. And we'll see that a bit later as well. Uh, we do capture information about deserialization, about crypto. So for example, if you have certificates that you're using that are about to expire, JFR can provide you with information about what's being used and when, when you might run into issues, sort of predict the future. Uh, and also TLS, information about protocols used, versions, things like that. In the VM, we're capturing a lot of information about the execution that is going on. Uh, so everything from class loading, synchronization and locks, garbage collection, JIT compilation, all the sort of good stuff that we have internally. That again may help you understand what's actually happening in the runtime and for your application as a whole. And then finally at the bottom, we're capturing also uh, information about the environment you're executing in. So for example, the command line you use to start the instance, the, the process. 
the versions of the JDK you're using, the operating system stuff, and also CPU information. So what kind of CPU, how many cores, things like that. Again, not an exhaustive list, but just to get, give you a feeling for what's included. I did mention filtering uh, earlier, and uh, I'm also going to mention correlation here. So filtering, again, you can get all kinds of data from Flight Recorder, but one of the things you do need to do is to sort of keep that uh, bounded in some way. Uh, and we have a bunch of good defaults for this, uh, again, where we filter both on the type of event itself, but also on duration, as I mentioned. And that means that we can capture information, valuable information, and perhaps focus on the valuable information without uh, collecting too much data and blowing up sort of the, the uh, either in-memory footprint or the on-disk footprint. Uh, so Flight Recorder built into Flight Recorder, we do this filtering on the fly. So we only, if you remember the commit uh, method we called when we generated the event, that commit method already does the filtering. So it looks at the duration and only actually captures or writes the data to the stream in case the event takes, like is above the threshold, let's say, and is enabled. But the other aspect of this is the correlation. And here's where JFR really shines. Uh, you can start with your business application, and I'll show you uh, an example of this in a minute as well. And if you have the, the, the information, the event information for your business operation, and you see that that is taking a long time, you can sort of drill in. You can start from the top, focus on the, the transactions, let's say, that take a long time, and see what was going on at the same time, both in the same thread, but also in the, in the VM or runtime as a whole. And that can give you a very powerful way of analyzing not only the, the high level, but also sort of drill in and help you understand all of that. And I also mentioned that uh, Flight Recorder is very flexible. So you, can, uh, you can set up these defaults for the event in the code, but you can also, also override this later. And we have some, um, something called configuration files. Uh, they have the JFC suffix. Uh, there are a couple of them included in the JDK itself. You can find them in, in the directory specified there. There's the default profile or a configuration, which gives you a good set of data. Uh, it's actually very detailed um, for sort of the default case. We also have one called profile, which will give you a lot more information, but then the overhead is slightly higher. It's still not bad, I, I'll say that, but uh, it, it gives you more information sort of. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, creating your own profile, tip of the day is to copy, make your own file. Uh, don't change the ones that are in the JDK directory itself. Okay, so I've talked about performance. Let's look at what that actually looks like. Um, so first of all, why is Flight Recorder so fast? Why are we saying 1% and use it in production? Well, Flight Recorder, it was actually designed a long time back. Uh, Flight Recorder started its life more than 20 years ago now. It wasn't called Flight Recorder at the time, but one of the things we were looking at at the time was how we could speed up the JVM and the runtime. And it was actually really hard to get that information out of the runtime and look at it. But it turns out that the, the JVM actually collects all of this information. It needs that information in order to decide which methods to optimize or when to trigger a garbage collection, that sort of thing. So the information was there, it was just not possible to easily get to it. And so we started this project to sort of get that data out. And the other reason why this was useful is because we had a sustaining or support team that were working with customers and they had the same problem. We see that something is happening, like goes wrong or it doesn't behave the way it should. And the data is sort of there. If we could only get our hands on it, that would help so much. So we started that project and one of the things we did was just piggyback on the information that the JVM already collects. So we already have the information about methods and garbage collection, all of that. Let's just store it in a, in a form that is uh, easier to get to. The other reason why this is working so well is because we've, again, designed it in such a way that if you don't, especially if you don't have it on, the overhead is truly zero. We've designed our APIs in such a way that the JIT compiler knows how to optimize that code. So if the, the event is not actually enabled, all of it will just be optimized away, that code eliminated. But also in the VM itself, we're not initializing the system unless you ask for it. And, and again, the overhead is truly very low for that. If you have it on, we're collecting this information initially in thread local buffers, which is very cache efficient and fast. And finally, as I mentioned, the on-disk format is also optimized to be very dense and provide you with all of this information with, with uh, a truly sort of packed format. <clears throat> 
So for all of these reasons, we, we get really, really good performance and we encourage you to use it in production. So that's a lot of words. Let's look at what that looks like in chart form. So uh, here are a few different um, ways you can do logging. Uh, and we'll start from the left and you see here the cost, so the lower, lower the better. Uh, the first one is with JFR disabled. And as I mentioned, we've designed it to really have zero overhead if it's not enabled. So that, that we see that here as well. And obviously, I should preface this by saying your mileage may or even will vary here depending on your app. But this is sort of what we typically see and what the reason why we think JFR is, again, really good for production. So next up here, we have JFR enabled, but with stack trace equals one. And I mentioned earlier that one of the key sort of costs when it comes to flight recorder is the depth of the stack trace you capture. This is something that we're in the process of optimizing even further. And I don't want to scare you here. Um, this is just for a sort of a comparison that I've set the stack trace depth to one. Uh, even if you do some, some more, it's not going to explode. It's very, still very efficient. But just to compare it to these other things, I'm only capturing one the top frame here, so to speak. And you can see that there is an overhead, but the cost is in the order of, let's say, microsecond or so per operation. So it's very, very, very small. Let's compare that to some of the other, let's say, key frameworks or uh, libraries that you can use instead. So let's start with log4j. Log4j in the off state, so you're not logging anything, but you still have the code there, is it's almost zero. Let's round it off to zero. Let's be generous. But as you can see, if I actually turn it on in the in, at the info level, it has a tendency to have a really high cost associated with it. Uh, and this is, again, because you're now capturing more explicit information that isn't there in the same way, can't be optimized in the same way by the JVM. Uh, let's compare it also to Java util logging. Uh, in the off state, you can see that there is a cost. And sort of funnily enough, for some definition of funny, uh, it's actually higher than with uh, JFR on. So, yeah, just a data point, I guess. Uh, anybody there guess what the story is like for uh, Java, Java Util Logging Info, or for that sake, if you redirect the system out? Well, apologize for having to rescale the whole chart. Uh, as you can see, the other bars are now effectively gone. Uh, Java Util Logging has a very, very high cost associated with it. Uh, and even worse is if you decide to pipe it out the system out. Uh, it may work for single printf statements that show up very rarely. Uh, but for your innermost loop for your business application, that probably isn't the way to go. So JFR, again, is designed. And this is something we keep in mind for every improvement, every change we make to JFR, designed to be used in production with extremely low overhead. And by default, that's less than 1%. So you should use this in production. Let's talk about using JFR. How do you get started? There are two main ways that you can enable JFR. One is if you know already when you're starting up your application that you want Flight Recorder enabled. And in that case, there's a command line option that you can specify to the JVM. It's called Start Flight Recording. Uh, and it has a bunch of good defaults associated with it. Uh, that's the first line there. So you basically just do Start Flight Recording and then your normal Java command line options. Uh, but it also takes a number of arguments. Uh, you can, again, read more about this on, uh, uh, on our documentation pages. So I'll, uh, I have a slide at the end with more resources as well. Um, but one of the options, for example, is uh, file name. Uh, so I mentioned Flight Recorder does all of this work in the background. If you want to store the data and look at it later, it's helpful, obviously, to spe specify where you want it. Uh, so with the file name argument, you can say, write it to this file. Uh, and you can also see that there that I have dump on exit equals true, and that tells the VM to dump out the data when the process exits. The other way or other mode to do this in is if you already have a running application, but you realize later that, ah, should I run with Flight Recorder? Uh, in that case, you can use jcommand. Uh, for those of you who don't know, jcommand is a tool that you can find in the Java Home bin directory. Uh, and it has a bunch of different things that it can do, but one of them is to control Flight Recorder. The way you do that is by specifying the, the PID. In this case, I've, it's 4711. Obviously, that will depend on your exact uh, uh, process. Uh, and I uh, specified the jfr.start command. And what this will do is start a recording in the background. There are options that you can specify here as well. But in the default case, you get a default recording. 
Uh, and then later, if you run into some event, you want to get this data out, you can use uh, the jfr.dump command. Uh, and it too takes a bunch of options. One of them is file name, much like uh, for the, the command line argument. Um, and uh, you can also specify things like max size. So in case uh, I've been running this for quite a while and I only want to get, uh, let's say 50 megs of data, then I can specify that. So those are a couple of the key um, uh, ways of running Flight Recorder. So let's do a demo. Uh, let's see if that we can make that work. Uh, so here I actually have that uh, business app that I showed you earlier, that example. Uh, so I have my event specified, much like we saw on the earlier slides. Uh, I have a small business application. Uh, it's not very powerful. I don't, I don't think this is the next startup idea. Uh, it will do call the do thing method, uh, which does exactly what we saw before. It will create this event, run the, the business logic, which in this case is a no-op, um, and, and then exit the application. So let's run that. Uh, so I'm going to say start flight recording. File name equals, let's call it uh, my business app.ga4, dump on exit true, and uh, my business app. So this should be familiar from the earlier slide. We see that it completes very quickly. You do get a few log messages telling you that ga4 actually did something. Uh, and obviously this is not going to be the most powerful demo. Your business application will hopefully do something more reasonable, run for a longer time and collect more information. But this should sort of give you a, a feeling for what's going on. So in my current directory here, I now have a file. I can analyze this file using another command line tool called JFR. Uh, this is also since of a few releases ago um, uh, in your bin directory, uh, Java home bin directory. And it has a few different commands that you can execute for a given recording. So let's start with jfr uh, summary. So if I do that for my uh, recording here and I pipe it to less, uh, we'll get a sort of summary of what this recording is. The version information, when we did this, the duration, which in this case is you know, a sad zero seconds, um, but uh, uh, your, your real recordings are likely to be longer. Uh, and you get a summary of the kind of events that are included in this recording. Uh, the other command that I'm going to show you is print. Uh, and if I just execute print, you'll get a, you know, th this kind of representation. But I'm going to immediately turn around and ask for it to produce JSON, because I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you are more familiar with JSON output. Uh, and in this case, you get a, um, uh, a JSON, you know, set of JSON stuff, let's say. Uh, this, this is all sort of the information about what's in this recording. And if we search for, remember that we called our, um, our event com.example.transaction, you will see that one of the events included in this recording is that transaction event. We see that it has the start time, the duration, very short, uh, some information about the thread it was executing in, some stack trace information, and, and this is, remember that the recording data here is sort of separate from the presentation. So what J, the JFR tool has done here is to help you inject sort of in, in line, if you so will, both the thread and the stack trace information in the actual JSON information itself. And finally, if I scroll down a bit, you can see both the ID field and the message field. So zooming out a few steps, we showed, I showed you what this looks like if you use mission control to visualize it. You can obviously get this text representation but the idea here is that you can also do your own visualization if you want to. You can get access to the data and present it in various different ways depending on what you think is useful. Um, I'll also mention that JFR, the tool, uh, the command line tool here, does a few other in interesting things as well. One of them is, for example, Scrub. Scrub is a way to filter the information that you have in the recording. So say that it, the recording is too large or it contains some kind of sensitive information that you want to exclude because you want to send this file off to your colleague or whatever. Uh, then you can use scrub to exclude or include depending on uh, some of the information. There's also a way of disassembling it, so splitting it up in smaller chunks or for that sake if you have chunks, assemble them into a larger recording. So there are a few other things that the JFR tool can do as well. So going back to the presentation, I've showed you now a number of sort of ways you can use JFR in your own application, but let's look at concrete examples because I want you to feel 
you know, interested in JFR and see how you can use this. So what I'm going to show you next is a few examples of how you can potentially use JFR. The first uh, example I'm going to show you is leveraging an API that we introduced in JDK 14 called event streaming. There's a JEP, a JDK enhancement proposal that uh, uh, has more information about this. So if you want to read up on all the details, I encourage, encourage you to go to that URL. But basically what event streaming is, is a way of continuously processing all the events that come out of Flight Recorder. And I wanna make it clear that this is not real-time processing. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you on the next slide as well and uh, remind me if I get to clarify it or say it again. But it, it, there's a slight lag here in that the data gets captured by JFR in the background. But it, there is a slight lag, and it's already in the order of a second. You can think of it as a second at least, uh, before you actually get the callbacks and you can act on that data. So it's not meant for real-time processing and actions on the event that, that are triggered. It's just for processing it, analyzing it in, you know, afterwards, sort of. Um, but the nice thing about this is that you can do this in process to get like next to, in another thread next to your real application, or for that sake, in another process as long as it's on the same machine and sharing the file system. Uh, and this is an improve, we, you could do this technically before JDK 14 as well, but this API makes that much, much easier. Uh, you can go to the Java doc uh, if you want to have more information, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, so, the way you do this is by in your application or next to it, uh, you start off by uh, creating a recording stream. So this is a jdk.jfr.consumer type. It's in that package. Armed with your recording stream, uh, you ask for uh, certain events to be enabled. In this case, we're enabling an event called jdk.cpu load. The goal, by the way, of this example is to print out uh, the CPU load um, for the process right now and also some information about uh, contended locks. Uh, and in this case, I enable the CPU load event. This is one of those event events built into the Java runtime. And I say, I want these events generated with a certain period. And in this case, that's one second. So every second, we're gonna clock out one of these CPU load events. When one of those events happens, here is the callback I want to execute. And what we do in this case is to just print out the information. So I print out the machine total uh, for, for the, the sort of the CPU load for this machine. Uh, and you can think of machine total as one of those fields, uh, event specific payload fields uh, in the event itself. Uh, I also want to analyze, as I mentioned, contended locks. The way I do that is very similar. I enable the Java monitor enter event, uh, event yeah, will event. It's again one of those events built into the runtime. In this case, I'm saying with threshold. So what that's saying is I only want to capture uh, and get callbacks for events that take longer than 10 milliseconds. And this is basically if you synchronize on an, on an instance and it takes longer than 10 milliseconds to actually get that lock, acquire it, then we, the JFR will uh, generate an event. And what we do then in this case is to print out the type you're synchronizing on. This could be anything. It could be dumping the JDK flight recording to disk and sending it off to your colleague or calling out to some service. But in this case, I'm just printing out to the console. Finally, I call start. And what start will do here is to, in the current thread, start processing the event loop, sort of. And if one of these uh, conditions is true, it will call the callbacks. So you're, you're going through the data and if you live up to the conditions here, the, the event is enabled and it meets this threshold example for uh, Java monitor enter, you'll get the printout. So that's just one example. Let's look at something that maybe is more interesting. So we're sort of back to the, the example we had earlier of an application specific event. So I'm going to create here an event around my Again, important business logic. In this case, I'm handling HTTP requests. Uh, I create an event around that. This should be very familiar to the earlier example. I call it, in this case, HTTP request event. And the name I give it, using that first annotation, is com.example.http request. But otherwise, this is hopefully very familiar. I sprinkle the, the GFR um, uh, calls or code around my business transaction, and that, that again is very much in line with what we saw earlier. And then in the other end, now, now I'm collecting all the events and you know in the background uh, uh, processing them. So let's say that we want to do something f f fancy with this information. 
So we want to see for all our HTTP requests processing that take longer than 500 milliseconds, what was going on at the same time, and in particular, was garbage collection perhaps taking a long time? That's, that's our goal for this exercise. So the first thing I'll do is to, uh, I'll enable it, I haven't included that here, but if we get one of these com example HTTP requests, execute this callback. The first thing we do is explicitly filter on the duration. So again, I, I mentioned, let's only look at the events that take, or processing that takes longer than 500 milliseconds. The, the rest of it is sort of fine, the user didn't have time to react, but if it takes longer than that, we want to know what's going on. In this case, I'm printing out the information, so which uh, URI did we access and how long did it take. But in the next step, I want to look at what was going on at the same time. What, what made this uh, request take so long? And this is truly the power of Flight Recorder. What I'm gonna do now is to open up a window into the past. So I'm going to open up the exact same recording stream once more. And I'm going to ask for all the events, all the event data from one second before my request happened to one second after it. So now we have a window into the past, which includes both our requests somewhere in the middle there, but also everything around it that was going on. Next up, I'll say that uh, we want to analyze GC events, and in particular the GC phase pause event, which gives us information about what the GC was up to. Uh, and I want to see any GC pauses that took longer than 50 milliseconds that were overlapping with our request. I haven't included the code for overlap here, but you can imagine that since we now have a window that is two seconds, we only want the events that sort of spanned our request in some way. Uh, and finally, if we get that information printed out, this again could be anything, but hopefully this gives you sort of a feeling for the power of having the historical data and the way that you can analyze that and make use of it. That's local, uh, I mentioned uh, doing that processing on a local machine. The, what we did in JDK 16 was make that pretty much same API available across the network as well. Uh, and in particular, there's an API called remote streaming over JMX, which allows you to sort of process this data over the network. Imagine that you have a whole cluster of maybe ephemeral instances, they come and go. You want to capture this information and make sure that you can analyze it later. Uh, and the way you can do that is using pretty much the same exact API. I'm not gonna tell you how to set up a JMX connection, both because I'm not an expert on it, but also because it's sort of complicated. Uh, and it's also sort of orthogonal to this presentation. But you can see it at the bottom there, there's a link. Using something that is very similar to what we saw before, you can create a recording stream, only in this case it's called a remote recording stream instead. Uh, the a good thing to do is to set a max age that prevents you from collecting too much information. Uh, so in this case, I'm saying only keep the, the last 10 minutes of data or yeah, continuously 10 minutes of data. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to print out all the exceptions in the remote process. This again could be anything, but that's what I'm gonna do. So I enable the uh, event and if one of those events shows up, I'm going to print out the uh, exception information. So the type and the message. And finally, I call start. And this should be very similar to what we saw earlier, only now we're doing this across the network. And you can also do, use this sort of same logic to store information if, we, if you wanna keep it, not just process it, but also store it somewhere else. The final example I'm gonna show you is uh, using JFR for unit testing. Uh, this is sort of an interesting use of JFR that we didn't originally envision, but it actually turns out to be pretty powerful. Uh, so in this case, I'm gonna, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, we've deprecated finalizers for removal, and I'm going to show you how you can ensure that your application is not using finalizers or hasn't introduced new ones. So I open up a recording stream like I did in the past. Uh, I uh, uh, is enable the finalizer statistics event, and if one of those events shows up, I'm going to add it to a collection. I'm not showing how to initialize the connection here, uh, collection here, but you can en envision that it's a hash set, for example. Uh, and I store the type that has the finalizer in that collection. I use start a sync, which com com compared to earlier what we saw, will instead, instead of having the current thread start the processing, it will create a thread in the background that does this processing instead. I execute my application code, whatever that is. And then, and this is actually a new method in JDK 20, 
I stop the recording. This used to be more complicated until one of my colleagues pointed out that we, we may want this stop method uh, because it will make this much, much easier. Uh, so now we have all the recording data in the stream uh, and in the, uh, the hash set or collection. And the final thing we do is to assert that it's actually empty. So there were no types with finalizers. And hopefully your unit test passes. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know that uh, you should probably have a look at that type. So in summary, Flight Recorder is an event-based event tracing framework that we built into the Java runtime. Uh, it's continuously recording data so that you have it there when you need it. And it's extremely efficient. It's meant for production and has less than 1% overhead in the default case. We have very powerful APIs for either producing or consuming data and tools built to analyze uh, and look at this data. And finally, these are some resources, um, links to various places. Uh, we do have a lot of good information on inside.java uh, about Java development and what we're doing in the JDK in general, but for Flight Recorded specifically. Uh, and there are also a bunch of other links here uh, related to Flight Recorded. Thank you very much. And I'll go back to the resources slide. Okay.